Hello, my name is Beth Berenger, and I am the Director of Education Programs for Essex Heritage. Um, we are a regional organization that tries to connect people with the, the rich natural and historic and cultural resources in Essex County, Massachusetts. Um, and so, so pleased that you're joining us here this morning to um, join us for this third in our series of the Teaching Hidden Histories workshops. Um, and again, this uh, workshop series is made possible through generous funding from the National Park Foundation. We do have an affiliation with the National Park, so we were eligible to um, put in for a grant um, for the National Park Foundation and so glad that they were able to help us with that funding. Um, so just in terms of the Zoom stuff for today, we'd love to have you keep your camera on. Um, please do stay muted though, um, except when we're in breakout group, groups or if um, you know we call on you to talk and um, that's gonna happen uh, definitely throughout um, today's session. Um, always, of course, please feel free to use the chat um, feature. And um, I wanted to introduce uh, Sherry Grishin, my colleague from Essex Heritage, and she can just say hello. And I think maybe she can talk to us a little bit about the closed captioning that's available. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sherry Grishin, and um, I'm a program manager here at Essex Heritage. And yes, we're excited to have you here with us this morning. Um, we do have closed captioning available. If you go down to the bottom of your screen, you should be able to turn that on and off if you would like. So um, feel free to make use of that. And if you have any questions, technical type questions, feel free to message me in the chat um, during the session um, and I can hopefully help you out. Great, thank you so much, Sherry. Um, we wanted to start today with um, an acknowledgement, a land acknowledgement. This is definitely a work in progress. Um, but um, Essex Heritage has been working on this, so I'd like to share this with you now. Um, the Essex National Heritage Area encompasses land on which indigenous communities have thrived for millennia. The Massachusetts, Pawtucket, and Nipmuc are some of the communities who have inhabited the land that is now known as Essex County. The effects of colonization in the 17th century and earlier saw the suppression of indigenous cultures and voices in favor of colonial European cultures in the dominant narrative. Despite this, the indigenous communities of the region have continued to live, work, create, raise families, and honor the land which we call Essex County. Essex Heritage recognizes the devastating effects of colonization and industrialization on the established population and landscape, and maintains that this is still indigenous land and will always be indigenous land. As advocates for the appropriate interpretation and stewardship of our many natural, historic, and cultural resources, Essex Heritage has a responsibility to acknowledge all stories past and present. Indigenous peoples should not be relegated to history but are still here and are part of our shared story. As we move toward an equitable future, we will celebrate and continue to honor the heritage of the indigenous communities that have called this region home. Um, and I also wanted to introduce right now, um, Brian Sheehy. He is uh, the department chair for North Andover High School's social studies department, history department. And it's really because of Brian and Brian's students that this series kind of came into being. I'd love for him to just give us a couple of words about um, kind of the impetus for this series. Go ahead, Brian. Hey everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us on a Saturday it's going to be a hot day. Um, where this came from, a group of students reached out to me with this very bold action required email telling me how we needed to blow up our whole curriculum in North Andover. And, and really, they were kind of angry that they didn't learn about a lot of the, the racism, discrimination, um, just history behind um, a lot of things that they were seeing on their computer screens and TV screens over the summer. So um, it's tough to change curriculum as we all know, but providing um, opportunities for teachers like this to um, bring resources into their classroom I thought was pretty important. And a lot of the things that they were pretty upset about um, happened around, like around here. And I think a lot of times when we can bring that local connection and examine our, our, our local area. I think it, it just resonates more with our students. So that's kind of where this came from. And um, again, I'm, I'm grateful for all of you um, taking the time to uh, be part of this because it means a lot to the kids. When um, I told them about this, uh, they were really like, wow, that's awesome that all these teachers and, and all of these um, different educators from a variety of fields are coming together to be part of this, so. 
Great, thank you so much, Brian. Um, okay, going to my next slide here. It is not working. There we go. Um, we wanted to start also with this, this quote. It's a rather disturbing quote. It's an epigraph that was used in uh, Lisa's, Lisa Brooks's um, Our Beloved Kin. Um, uh, this work by indigenous author and scholar Lisa Brooks is, is a really um, very interesting and wonderful book, but we were sort of struck by the epigraph that she included um, and just wanted to read that to you. It says, the first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history. Then have somebody write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history. Before long, the nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. The world around it will forget even faster. Um, and so this quote by author Milan Kundera um, really sort of describes some of the, the extremely problematic um, you know, history that we have that was recorded for us um, that we really wanna to try to interrogate with this session. Um, and that's really our intention today is to try to right some of the profound wrongs that have happened in, in how we've all sort of absorbed this history and been taught um, this history. And so that's sort of gonna set our tone for today. Um, again, so these are some of the questions that we have here. Um, how does our exploration of misconceptions, and that's really how we've organized the themes of this workshop uh, around misconceptions um, in historiography surrounding the contact period and indigenous histories in our region, illuminate how some stories have been hidden in our larger American his history. Um, and this is this piece that's um, inclusive, where um, if you were able to watch Ruben Enrique's um, piece about um, Desi's focus with uh, Guiding Principle 2 for our frameworks on being inclusive, responsive, and critical. This idea of being more inclusive is sort of captured hopefully in this, this piece of our um, some of our goals here. Then how can we help students connect with this history, keeping their voices and ideas at the forefront of our teaching? Again, that's the responsive piece. And how do we create a safe environment for difficult conversations about complex issues surrounding race, identity, and what it means to be American, especially in a local context that might hit close to home. And that's that critical piece um, where we really want to be careful of that environment we're creating for, um, for our students. Um, so what are some of the examples of European American centered misconceptions about native peoples and this contact period in our region that highlight larger themes of exclusion, erasure, and the fight for acknowledgement and cultural preservation? And unfortunately, some of the local histories that um, you know, have really influenced how we understand this history um, have, have really been detrimental. And that's how we're going to um, kind of try to really start to, to change some of how we present this history to our students. And how can critical examination of sources from the region's past, we really have to keep that critical piece in mind as we're interrogating many of these sources, um, and as well as contemporary voices in the local indigenous community inform our understanding of how to approach this topic with our students. And then, okay, so for our agenda today, really we're just finishing up with our welcome and introduction right now. We have an amazing panel um, that we're gonna have some question and answers with. Brian, um, Brian Sheehy is gonna do some modeling of some of the sources and how we might use them with our students. And then we're gonna have time to go into breakout rooms where in smaller groups, we'll be able to interrogate some of the workshop um, content and primary sources in these theme-based groupings, thinking a little bit about how we might use this with students. Um, we do have PDPs and stipends for teachers who would like to access that opportunity. So we'll go over that at the end. Um, and we do have a couple of other opportunities we'd love to share with you. And if there's anyone who wants to stick around afterwards and isn't heading to a pool or a beach or some other fun thing today, we'll stick around a little bit. Um, there are some people we really wanted to thank um, who helped us so much. Um, we um, first off wanted to thank Mary Ellen Lepianca, an independent scholar in our region, who is an amazing resource. She has done phenomenal research in um, a lot of these very local histories. And we've included um, a ton of resources that she's put together on the website. Um, we also had a wonderful conversation with her and, and are so grateful to all of the work that she's done in this area. Elizabeth Peterson from the city of Salem, Lindsay Randall, Jan Williams from Buttonwoods, Marianne Zajewski and uh, Nora Halloran from National Park Service. 
um, North Parish Church in Andover and many local libraries and historical societies have really helped us put together today's session. We're very, very grateful to all of them. Um, and then uh, again, wanted to just thank our contributors this morning, Brian Sheehy and his students at North Andover High School. Um, Dr. Brad Austin, who is our moderator, um, and he is from Salem State University. Anna Juan Whedon, um, an enrolled member of Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe. Hopefully you were able to take a look at his um, recording. We thank him so much. He, he's been recovering from surgery and just had a lot of technical issues, but was very um, willing to persevere and try to make a recording for us. We just sent it last night, so I know that many of you probably didn't have a chance to take a look at it, and I'm not sure that he's going to be able to join us this morning. Um, he had a conflict, but he was going to try if he could, um, but really want to thank um, Anawan. Dr. Margaret Newell from the University of Ohio, Ohio, we are so honored to have her here with us today and Dr. Tad Baker from Salem State University. Elizabeth Solomon, also an enrolled uh, Massachusetts tribe member. Uh, we had many discussions with her, but she was unable to join us and, and has been a little bit out of commission, unfortunately, due to some medical issues. Um, so uh, we did include a presentation that she had recorded. So hopefully you've got a, a chance to take a look at that. And also Ruben Henriquez from DESE, who's really helped us think about um, some of the, the ways that the state is really encouraging teachers to be um, looking at these hidden histories. We're very grateful to him. Um, and so now we're gonna go over to Brad, Dr. Brad Austin, and he is going to lead us into our panel. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Beth, and, and welcome everyone. It's so great to see so many familiar faces. I usually only see Tad in, um, in the hallways or when I've been called to the, the provost's office where Tad um, now now works, and I only see um, Dr. Newell when uh, Margaret, whenever um, she's collecting a major book award at a, a national conference. Uh, so it's great to see see them here. Um, Beth, I want to begin though. You began with something really important, and that names matter. Um, and I'd just like to point out that Dr. Newell teaches at the Ohio State University and not the University of Ohio. Um, it, the, for people they're taking <laughs> they take the the part really seriously, and so instead of having her have to. Um, Sorry about that. I'll write you a stern letter or email. <laughs> I'm sure she doesn't care, but, um, but it's, just, it's just a funny, it's a weird Ohio State thing. Um, the, these are big, big topics. Um, you know, we have, um, we could, we could, in fact, maybe we should run entire graduate courses on, on New England, um, Native Americans, and the Essex County region. Um, you know, I just mentioned some of Dr. Newell's work, you know, her, her book, um, Brethren by Nature, New England Colonists and the Origins of American Slavery, which by the way, won the award as, from the OAH as the best book on race, which is kind of a big topic um, in, a, in a one or two year period. Um, you know, their entire, you know, big books about this stuff. We're trying to um, introduce us to a lot of topics and teaching approaches and information um, and perspectives in essentially a, a two hour workshop. So. Um, You'll forgive us for our ambition, but also um, forgive us if a lot of we leave a lot of the work to 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 all of us as, as professionals to kind of follow up on where we think it's most relevant. Um, so with that as a way of introduction, let's let's dive in. Um, again, thank you, um, thank you to the panelists to join us, um, and let's just jump in. One of the questions we have from teacher collected from a teacher beforehand was from William Tobin, um, gang, and it's it's really at the heart of of the presentations. Um, the excellent presentations that we, we got from Anawan, from, from Margaret, from Tad. And the question for that William asked is, what's the best way to use original source documents to get to perspectives of Native Americans? Now, I took a lot of notes because um, that's one of my teaching goals as well, based on the presentations. I wonder if I can turn it over maybe to Margaret first um, and just, just give us some, some ideas about, you know, how can we, what are the, some of the sources either that you mentioned in your presentation or that you're really uh, a fan of for, for teaching and to prioritize Native American voices and not just their stories? Well, I mean, slavery is a, is a tough uh, place to begin a, a discussion of, of, of gaining Native American voices because it's a, all the stuff I'm talking about is happening in an early period. Um, and it's where it's that Milan Kundera quote, you know, this is a particularly illustrative period for that erasure of you know, erasure of history, the rewriting of history is, be, is, is starting from, the, you know, the Pequot conflict onward in, in many ways. So um, I find, I thought the most, 
you know, almost the most activist scholarship uh, uh, thing you could do is the reconstruct people's biography, reconstructing the biography of the enslaved. So, you know, the, so what I tried to do with the sources I, I provided to Beth was um, to give, to suggest some starting points. So I, I would take, I, I think these um, um, newspaper runaway uh, or sale advertisements, which sometimes give you names, sometimes give you, you know, ethnicity in terms of a, a, a place, you know, where they, where are they running to? where are they running from. They might actually give you a, a travel affiliation. Sometimes you can tell from surnames and then the students can actually then kind of enter into, you know, genea there's ample uh, genealogy, Native American genealogy online. And um, there's a, a fantastic book, a couple scholars in, uh, uh, scholars of color uh, put together this amazing uh, genealogical resource for people, uh, of color in the 17th and 18th century. And it's, the title says Southeastern Connecticut, but it really does Southern New England. So I, I go back to that a lot too, because they, they basically scoured a lot of local town and court records to try to, to, try to find some families over generations. Um, so, so, you know, with those ads, you can, you, can, you know, you can maybe find out, you know, find an individual whose story you can start to examine, you can at least get a snapshot of an individual life. You can look at, you know, where, who they're running away from, you know, what household get some more information on that and that environment you know language are they are they you know sometimes the dads actually say speaks english well or doesn't speak english very well um is this a spanish indian or somebody from indonesia or is this uh, somebody who seems to be a, a native new englander what are they wearing what skills are they associated with what injuries what markings you know often they're, they're very specific uh information about their physical state and you can tell something about how they've perhaps been treated, what sort of work they've had to do, you know, what sort of skills they bring, in what ways they've had to clearly learn other skills that weren't part of their, you know, what would have been a gendered um, work life within a, an indigenous community, or maybe the skills they've transferred over. So that's, you know, that's one set of things that are challenging, but I think students can read. And then that other, I included a, a deposition or, or a court proceeding um, inviting the, involving the uh, Hawthorne, Hawthorne brothers, because uh, so it, it started with a very bare, um, a very bare court um, decision, which was to return this girl, runaway girl, to her master, the slave, you know, the slaveholder. Um, but but then there was then in the footnotes, there's pages of discussion. So so when when there. So court records are my other big source, but they're they're sometimes challenging to access, right? That's their manuscript often. Um, but these Ipswich records are published, and if you have a high school student, they're probably capable of going into the town hall and working with some of these manuscript records. But the, the gold is often in these depositions and all of the the files that accompany these very bare court decisions. So some of those things are published. The colonial legislation is published and accessible in. You know, it was published in the 19th century, republished in the 20th, but, you know, there's, there's vol these volumes are hanging around. Students can read these, so they can read the legislation surrounding Indians. But these depositions is where you get a lot of information, a lot of biography, and then can reconstruct more. So those are, those are two places, you know, these, these are published newspaper as it's from a later period. And the um, legal documents, uh, both colonial laws, and which you also often see indigenous groups fighting back, you know. So, so the, the the nations themselves are protesting slavery, and this gets entered into the into the record of the colonial governments. Uh, are the protests of leaders and the pressure for change and the the particular kinds of practices they see as as being oppressive and as you know leading to the enslavement of people and so on. So that's an ongoing dialogue where you get some indigenous voice. That's great. Thank you, Margaret. I, you know, the examples you gave were some of the ones that I noticed myself. Um, I don't think I was looking at the footnotes and I was, I was thinking that I don't think I'm, I'm not sure I'm equipped to make sense of everything that's going on in those kind of legal footnotes. Um, and I'm positive my students wouldn't may not be you know motivated to read two and a half pages of footnotes. Um, but the, the runaway, the, the ad, I think the 1711 ad you used with, and you, I think you characterize it as this is a slave insurrection. This is this is a rebellion. I think that's such a powerful way to think about this. And I love 
um, the names and the, you see men and women, different skill sets and the fact they're, they're from Carolinas and they're, you know, and they may steal a boat. There's, there's so much there that, um, that we can use with our students to kind of really prioritize these, um, these people as people with agency and looking for um, to kind of control their lives. So I think that that's a great way. Tad, you, I know you talk a lot about deeds and how we can read against the grain with deeds. Um, is, you know, to, to, to William's question, is that where you would start? Well, um, good question, Brad. I might. Um, it depends in large part on what, uh, on what age of, of students we're talking about, obviously, right? And I guess I'll sort of preface this by saying is this is, you know, this, this isn't just hidden history. This is tough history, right? These are, these are difficult subjects to tackle. And uh, I think really, as, as just watching uh, Anna Wan's talk before um, I came on, and I think, you know, he talked about the sensitivity of that, of like, you know, how we deal with it with kindergartners is very different than, say, like 11th graders, right, in, in APUSH. Um, and I, I actually sort of as a personal acknowledgement to that, it's like, um, honestly, I did used to teach. I may not remember. may have been before your time even, Brad, but at one point, I actually did teach Native American history at Salem State. And uh, I gave it up for a couple of reasons, and frankly, in large part, because uh, it's so tragic. Uh, it doesn't end well. There's no happy ending. If the happy ending is casinos, um, I think we're all in trouble. Um, so um, I've sort of shied away from it, and I've turned my, turned myself to uh, less less tragic and less controversial things like the Salem witch trials. Um, so, but anyhow, so um, certainly though, yeah, for high school students, Brad, um, that, that SalemDeeds.com is a, is a very useful site. Um, I will I will warn that um, letting your students loose on it is probably not the best thing because some of the the writings in there, even Pearly himself, who edited the book on the deeds, is talking from an early 20th century, very, just a very white perspective of a, of a traditional, uh, you know, Eurocentric view of things. Uh, and, and frankly, some of it's kind of uh, offensive by modern day standards, I think you'd say. But the primary sources are the, are the real deal. And to me, they're, uh, but even there too, again, it depends, you know, for, this is probably like middle school, high school level sort of stuff, because it is, they are so complex, but there's great stuff there that people can unpack, um, especially if you are, you know, as Brian suggested, studying local history. Like, well, gee, why is it that uh, if the English first settled Essex County in the 1630s, that we only have a couple deeds survive from like before the 1680s? Why weren't they buying the land then? What does that say about them that they thought that they 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 uh, they owned the land and? and uh, to me, actually, Roger Williams is a great story even to get in there, too, so for a couple of reasons. One is, talk about place, everyone um, everyone outside of, uh, I think, Salem assumes that, S that Roger Williams was minister at Boston, which, of course, he wasn't. He was in Plymouth, at Salem, first in Plymouth and then at Salem. And so you can go back even to some of Roger Williams' discussions that's where Williams actually calls, um, and I can, I can send these references on, where, where Williams... Um, uh, is arguing with John Winthrop, essentially. Winthrop's going like, well, um, you know, we own the land. The king gave it to us, and the king discovered it, and we own it. And Williams is going like, well, that's really not true. And if that's true, then the king's a liar. <laughs> At which point, Williams, uh, people are saying, whoa, 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 that's treason, Roger. We can't handle that right here. So I think the deeds has a lot of different entry points. And I'm and, and kind of tying into Margaret's um, point, actually, the deeds from the 1680s, you can create biography out of and genealogy because essentially what, what uh, the local towns did during the dominion of New England, they were terrified that, that uh, Governor Andros would, would take the title to all their land and start charging them rent. And so what, what do they do? They go searching high and low all throughout Massachusetts for like the grandsons and granddaughters, the descendants of the people who were sachems in the 1620s and 1630s. And they have to, and in the deeds, you see incorporated this, this family genealogy. I am so-and-so, my mom was so-and-so, my grandfather was so-and-so, Chief Sagamore, right? That kind of thing. So I guess part of it is too, is even with something as dry as deeds, you'd be amazed the kinds of information you can tease out in them. Um, so I, I really do recommend them. And again, like a close reading of them because a lot of the, again, like it's what's not said you know, for valuable considerations given. Well, if you were to buy or sell a house today, would, would, you, would you do that? Or would your parents insist that the price be in writing as to what they were getting for the house that they were selling when you were, when you were moving? Yeah, okay, so what is, what's going on? What might it be that they're trading for this land? 
Could it be illegal things like guns and liquor? Um, wow, because you don't want to put that in writing, do you, right? So um, deeds is one thing. And the other thing I want to mention quickly, um, I, I talked a lot about maps, and I think maps were a really wonderful entry point to this, particularly for younger students. Um, uh, and again, everyone loves maps. They're colorful. There's a lot of them available online. Um, and the one I, I like to start with actually is John Smith, a map of New England, 1616. He names this territory that people have been living at for at least 12,000 years, right? He erases Native American place names completely. If you look at that map, all the names are English. What does that say about the intent of the English when they come here in the 1620s and 1630s? And, you know, I could go on on that, but I, I highly recommend the maps too. No, I, I agree with you, Tad. And um, I think the deeds, if we as teachers are going to make a commitment to using the deeds, then that's a, that's a big commitment. Like that's a whole class to like look at a deed. And you're talking yeah. skill development. You're talking about, you know, you know, I think in your presentation you talked about, now who would include this? Now who's asking for this? You know, there's, there's a lot of really important um, kind of historical thinking skills we can teach through that. But if we're, if we're not wanting to do all of that work on the deed, um, and maybe it would be important to do that for, you know, if we can find the deed for, um, for your town, or if you're talking about land acknowledgements and how, you know, these are becoming more commonly practiced now. Um, I think the maps are a way to go to show the presence. And one of the things I really appreciate about these presentations is that I, as a teacher, saw opportunities to do at least kind of three things. One is include native voices and native participation in a variety of quote unquote more traditional historical topics right um it may be in ways that um, we don't often think about it and margaret is such a, a useful corrective one of the reasons her book was so important is it reminds us that race in the united states is, has never been only black and white um slavery has never been only black and white um you know she's given us examples of was it caesar or margaret who was you know, he's arguing, look, I've got a black father, uh, um, a native mother, but I follow her, so therefore I'm, I, I should be free, and therefore, you know, you know, there's so much there in those stories that we can, can look at touch a big topic. So one is inclusion um, and incorporation. The other is these, these sources give us a chance to center the native perspective and center um, native experiences in ways that um, maybe I, I just didn't feel equipped um, to do so before. And third is that, especially if you're teaching I think one of the arguments here is that we, we shouldn't be talking about Native Americans only in the kind of, you know, pre-contact colonial period, but the, you know, you know, one of Anwan's main points is, look, we're still here. And, you know, this, this, this history continues to matter. Um, but if you're teaching some of these topics earlier in your class, when you can really want to get a, a, a good kind of skill basis, there's a lot of good skill work to be done with some of these sources. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to say, I've, I've gone into, you know, Columbus City Schools, um, middle school classrooms with transcriptions of court documents and things like that. And they've done pretty well with them. You know, <laughs> I, I, I remember one, I, you know, it was, I, you know, it was an indictment. Uh, I had, you know, I, I had given, you know, I had kind of a long setup, but I put them in little groups and I gave them this document. This one, one girl just looked up at me and said, this is a setup. I'm like, Exactly. <laughs> I spent 10 minutes saying that, but yes, that is exactly what it is, you know, so, so they were actually, I was surprised that, you know, they, are, they figured it out pretty quickly. So, you know, you can, you can transcribe them. I, I think that, I think in the teaching of African slavery, the use of these runaway ads, the use of the laws, the slave codes, I mean, so you could, I included a, a, a slave, some slave codes from the Massachusetts, um, uh, from the, uh, sort of both messages of laws, both from the 1640s and then from the, um, I can't remember what year the one, the other one I popped up might've been from the early 1700s, but I mean, those are published too. Just to sort of, so let them, you know, they've probably only read, they're probably getting these slave codes when they're learning about African slavery, right? The Virgin, early Virginia codes and stuff. That's part of the curriculum now for K through, you know, K through eight around here. But, you know, popping in this, <laughs> Showing them in their home state that these codes are on the books there. This is, you know, slavery in the north. Um, I also like, you know, I saw the. Um, I was interested in that Lawrence um, newspaper slide that you popped up of the, the riots of the eighteen fifty of the 19, uh, 1954 or 1984. I couldn't catch the date. So you know, you could start with the present, and you could sort of, um, you know, say, do you under, do you know that there's a lawsuit to take away the Wampanoag Reservation right now? That the Trump administration initiated, 
and that um, it, the federal judge has actually ruled in favor of the indigenous people. But this is the Mashpee, the Mashpee Wampanoag, um, and uh, the the you know the the administration's argument was that these aren't that it's not a federal reservation because it was created during the colonial period by the state of Massachusetts. And so they are actually locked in a kind of existential battle over whether they, in the, in the now, whether they're gonna to get to keep this reservation. You know, it could start with that. You could start with the debates in the, I mentioned in my presentation in the 1980s and 90s about whether these tribes deserve federal recognition because they look too black. I mean, this was basically the exclude, you know, the, they're not Indian anymore. So where does that thing come from? Well, that you know, people are already talking about that. I, by that I mean, uh, you know, in the early national period, um, you know, the guardians of the Indians, the uh, officials who are sort of supervising these res reserve areas, were already kind of complaining about this. And there was this whole trope about the last full-blooded Indian. They were always they're always writing these stories in the in the newspapers and the beginning in the 1790s was like all through the 19th century into the 20th century, the last full-blooded Indian in, you, you fill in the blank of the town. So this was like kind of a popular genre, the last, over, done. So what, so then what you have in the modern era is, is not, these people are not truly indigenous, right? That's the, that's the claim, They're, and it's tied to rights to land. So you could sort of start with contemporary activism. You could start with Native Americans being involved in the environmental movement, which they very much were involved in the restart of, you know, the 1970s, 1980s, the modern environmental movement in New England of activism to clean up the Charles River, Mary Mack Valley, you know, these power plant battles, there are often kind of indigenous people that were really big movers of that. So, I mean, if the present is, you know, and there, there were, there were kind of, there was a big, um, uh, you know, the, the red power movement that we associate with the West had a big, Eastern component of activists who were, you know, camping out the Massasoit statue and painting it red and like really drawing attention. And, you know, their activism has led to the redoing of the interpretation of Plymouth Plantation and many other historical sites. So, so they've really transformed things. So I think students are interested in activism. Well, now. that's one of those things Sarah is pointing out in the chat that her third graders are much more engaged with kind of the recent oh. stuff. And I guess you know, as historians, you know, we spent much of the last couple of decades saying, hey, we matter. And now we're saying, oh my God, all this stuff really matters. <laughs> it's, it's almost like we, the, our, our demand to be, be relevant has um, come back to bite us in the last- Well, but it, I mean, all this has a long history. So, yeah. so here we are, you know, what's, how do we get here? You know, so I think there's also, there are all these people in the night, all these indigenous people in the 19th century who really, um, who, who who actually did like publish magazines and put together exhibits and you know, kind of fought to, you know, fought for preservation in, in that context. Um, and there's, you know, I think, I think that's actually in some ways a more complicated, a complicated story and really might require the, you know, the high school age students to, to, to understand, to understand that bridge period. In funny way, I think the colonial period is a little more clear. The present day is a little more clear and the inter intervening period is, in its own way, a little bit less documented and a little bit more more complex, but uh, would all would be kind of um, useful points of entry. So, I mean, I I I'm going to defend those uh, those Ipswich documents, those court that court case involving Mall. I think is everything. I think there's so much in there because there's there's also there's like the whole story about what happened to her. There's like the fist fights amongst the the um, some of the you know English colonists over what should happen. There's for the, like the guy you know Hawthorne actually saying, "Oh my God, if I, I'm a parent and I have a daughter, all of a sudden I'm starting to see, you know, this is like these are choices people are making day in and day out to enslave other people. Like, what, you know, what's holding them back, and what is you know why do they why do they why in the end doesn't that hold them back enough? So well, uh, you know, I think as as well as the victim and and what her like. Her position in this, in these these proceedings, is I think, I think you you get at how you know it is a snapshot of how this happens and and what the you know what the costs are for for victims. So you know, so we're talking about slavery that doesn't have a middle passage, or it has a middle passage for Spanish Indians, and it has a reverse middle passage. But there, these are not people brought to your shores. You know, these are people you're 
you're kind of enslaved, you're enslaving. Yeah. Um, so, or, or as you point out, or taken away from your shores and sent yeah. to Spain or sent to Jamaica and other things. Um, yeah, when I was listening to you um, tell the story of, of Maul, and I was just thinking, uh, some people may know Wendy Warren's essay, The Cause for Grief, which is so good about enslavement of, a, of an African woman in Boston a little before this period in the 1630s, early 1640s. Um, and it's just such a, a great example of historical writing where someone takes this one case study and then suddenly you're talking about all these things and you're asking these questions and some are knowable and some are, unknow some are unknowable. I use it in my methodology classes. Um, I, I was thinking that, oh heck, I should be using this as a, as a counterpoint to it. Um, I was also thinking, Margaret, to your, to kind of your points earlier um, about connections, one of the things that I really always admired about your work and certainly in this talk is the notion that, look, it's not, it's not clear cut, right? The, the body of liberties is a law that's created in 1641. Those of us who teach more modern stuff often talk about civil rights and we ask, sometimes ask the questions, do laws kind of reflect conditions or create conditions? And so your argument that the 1641 law is probably trying to justify what they've been doing um, makes a lot of sense to me. But then also, when you, as you talk about the more ambiguous period, uh, as we move into the 1700s of judicial enslavement, you know, one could, you know, a, an issue that's in, in front of my students, you know, Lori, we've shared some of the same students. They're, they're very interested in talking about mass incarceration. They're talking about the, the carceral state. Well, you know, tracing it back to not just through Jim Crow and not just through the black-white binary, but tracing it back to, to Massachusetts, to so the 1700s. Um, gives a, a really important context for this, I think. Um, so I, I just wanted to point that out. Oh what yeah, this is, you know, I think the cultural straight state starts in the 19th century. You know, so what the, I mean, at the story after the story is is that, is that these people start getting incarcerated instead of, um, you know, sent, instead of enslaved, yeah. <laughs> or instead of you know bound into servitude. And that continues for quite a while, actually, into the 19th century. But there's an incarceration. I'm, I'm giving a talk at the uh, at a, at a um, the old jail, the old jail in York, Maine, they have like, just, they have hundreds of uh, documents of Native Americans and Africans being held there and children born there and all kinds of crazy stuff from the colonial period. Because I, 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 I mean, there's two people in particular who are in prison, they're Native Americans who had been enslaved in New England who end up on death row there. Um, so, uh, so there, you know, I think and I think that's what Wendy Warren's working on now is kind of the sort of incarceration in the 19th century. Um, but you know, you could you could make a tie to that because a lot some of the way that the people get enslaved by the courts in the, 19, in the 18th century is they get, you know, they get charged for their upkeep while they're being held before their trials. So even these brief periods in jail, you get charged for them. It gets added to the time you have to uh, the, the restitution. Mm -hmm. So there would be there would be a kind of way to 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 think about the this as a as a form of um, of that judicial enslavement as a as linked to the the present day carceral state. So that's a great idea. As a moderator, I'm gonna call a timeout because Marie may not know, but Tad is from York, Maine. Um, has a historical house there, and used to be head of the Maine His um, Cultural Council or whatever. This could go sideways in York history. I, I, I'm not going to mention Maine, but I, I am right now about. A mile and a half away from the old jail, and I and I'm on their collections committee, and I know it well. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll call time out because I've I've talked to <laughs> Tad main history, and this is this could go nowhere. Yeah, hey, let me though I, just to pick up on a couple of things yeah. that Margaret was saying. Um, I, I you know that whole issue. I think in, another way of looking at it is going from the present backwards and looking particularly at the issue of of identity, um, and maybe you know like land acknowledgments is a good place to start. And frankly, I think I feel that if you're if you're most organizations. They'll do a land acknowledgement and say, well, we've done that. And I was like, nope, that's your starting point, right? Um, and, and also, and part of the two though gets to this whole issue uh, that Margaret was talking about, about, about recognition of peoples as, as a tribe, uh, as, as a nation, and, and, and the difficult times that they, they face that. And, and in part of it too, I think is based on this sense of identity. And Anwan did a great job of talking about this. So it's sort of like, you know, why is it that like, no one expects white people now to wear pointed hats and dress in black and white. Whereas Native Americans, if they don't show up on their pony, uh, you know, wearing leather buckskins or something that somehow that they're not Native American, right? That, that appearances change. And again, and maybe an interesting way into that might even sort of be, you know, and, and I think students of most ages relate to this is, you know, the whole, whole issue of, of, of people and what they, what they prefer to be called. What pronouns do they prefer to use? 
Um, how do they portray themselves? And, and that's authentic because that's what people say is authentic, right? And that don't expect, uh, don't expect Native Americans to look like an old Western or something, particularly in New England, they never looked like an old Western surprise, you know? Um, so that, I think that might be a sort of, again, sort of a helpful way of looking at it, that the, the Native Americans today, um, how, do, how do they, and this is, to me, this, is, this is very tricky stuff, right? It's like, how do they want to be portrayed? How do they want to be called? Um, what, 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 is, what is important to them and, and how they are, they are recognized? And that's not for us as historians to say as much as, but we're, we're gonna be, I'll give you one really quick example of this. Um, uh, I, I'm, work, I'm on the committee with, with Elizabeth Peterson in, in, in Salem, where we are recreating a new pioneer village. And it's very important for us to have Native American, you know, not just voice, but frankly, strong input into that process. Uh, because they wanted to create, you know, Native American we twos, but basically also sort of saying like to the Massachusetts who are consulting on this, um, okay, what do you want to do? You tell us what to do. And, and for what it's worth, the answer that, we, that Elizabeth got kind of set her back because she was expecting, I think she was expecting, hey, look, well, we, know, we know how to make we twos and dugouts and we'll be glad to do that. But instead they said, we don't want that. We don't want Native Americans depicted in the 17th century. Because if you do that, they're gonna expect us to look like that and act like that. They, they're not gonna acknowledge that we are modern day residents of Massachusetts just like everyone else. So I think there's a lot, a huge amount we could unpack that we could spend a whole graduate seminar just talking about this, right? Um, but just to sort of think about this to me is this sort of idea of sensitivity and identity and, and letting people tell us how they wanna be identified and how they want to engage with us even on an issue like land acknowledgement, because frankly, I, th I, I, I worry that we're sort of pestering folks like, um, excuse me, could you tell me, you know, um, who you are and what name we should put on the land acknowledgement? <laughs> but anyhow. Yeah, I mean, to get to your point, there's two things. One is that um, according to my text messages, we're going to um, uh, make sure that everybody gets a chance to see Anna Wine's talk. So we're going to actually um, show part of it in a second, because as you said, including native voices whenever possible is, is essential. So it's not just a resource that people may click on. We want to have part of it there. But the other is I'm thinking about the, most of us have probably been to Plymouth Plantation and the interpretive decisions the, the people there have made is that the, um, basically the, the white folks can dress up and act old and timey because we know they're dressing up. Um, the native peoples are going to be themselves as they are in the 21st century because we can't assume that all of our visitors will will know that the the dress up 17th century period clothes are not the way quote unquote they are these days and so i think you know that that's a very proactive way of you know saying one thing Anna one's gonna say in his talk in a second is you know we're still here we're still part of this um and i think that's you know as we as we as teachers as we as educators think back about the decisions these people have made same decisions we're making in our classrooms right about how to represent how to include certain perspectives um, I think that's a proactive um, decision um, there and one that we should we should recognize. The, um, the other thing is, is we're going to kind of wrap up a little bit this part is that it struck me from listening to the presentations um, and reviewing the resources is that it seems that these captivity narratives seem to be a really powerful opportunity for intervention, right? We've got the Hannah Dustin stories. We've got the memorials. We'll talk about that. Um, Anna Wan's talking to us. Um, about uh, the, the Mary Rowlandson um, and how in her experience, like, so if we listen to her you know, and her, her story, um, part of what she says is that, look, King Philip's folks treated me better as a woman than the colonists did. Um, and he was using that as a way to kind of, and um, to, to really, I guess, denaturalize or interrogate um, kind of, our, our, what maybe our students may have about theories about what's natural, about family organization, about societal organization, about, you know, about, um, you know, how power um, is distributed in our own communities. So for, for men and for women and whose voices. And so, you know, I first long, learned about um, the law of coverture from Dr. Newell uh, a little while ago, but I still talk about my class because this notion that women literally get covered um, by their, um, by the men in their lives and protected um, from, from the law is something that wasn't happening at the same time in the same place by people with different cultural traditions. Um, but the other thing is that just the, as, as, as Margaret pointed out in her talk, and maybe Margaret, you could tell us a little bit about because these are, are just are still seem so shocking to me, 
and maybe they shouldn't, is the notion of these kind of land privateers and the context for capture. And, you know, we have, you know, there's one here in, in, in Littleton there, you know, we have statues for the, the one, you know, the, the one single person who we can name, um, the, the English colonist who is captured and taken away. But Margaret, again, if everybody didn't get a chance to, or they don't remember from your talk about these land privateers, I think in the context of King Philip's War, can you give us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, uh, this group is um, really interesting. They had, they had been literal privateers in the Anglo-Dutch War. So these people had actually been ship, ship you know, privateers, pirates basically. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the end of the war, uh, um, you know, at the end of the Anglo-Dutch War, some of these Dutch privateers, some of the people who were on the other side were captured and were you know, temporarily jailed in Massachusetts. So this regiment was put together by a, you know, a New England privateer. But he actually brought these jailed Dutch people and put them in part as part of the unit. So this is like a basically a bunch of of you know, kind of very violent you know people, including convicted enemies of Massachusetts, who are who form this um, regiment, but they were excluded or, or exempted from um, military drill, and given a kind of special commission. And the commission was to go out and take captives. So I see this as uh, one of the documents I threw into the pot was was a call for troops for one of the wars on the on the main frontier on the New England northern New England frontier that follows King Philip's War. That's a series of wars. And you know, it's, it's incredibly brutal. It's basically showing the detailing the payments for children's scalps, for adult scalps, but also the, the gist is that the soldier participants get the profit, can take captives and sell them along the way. So this continues through the um, 1740s. So, so the, this privateer regiment you know, did some pretty, uh, pretty brutal work in uh, the Connecticut River Valley and then kind of pivoted into the, into the um, into Essex County and into um, then into Rhode Island, taking taking prisoners, um, executing you know interrogating, executing people on the spot, taking prisoners. You know some some of these people were from the praying towns, from the uh, communities, Christianized Indian communities, and so on. So I think the taking of captives was a big part of these wars, and uh, and generally the the. Chart, the documents, the just, justification, mobilization documents mention the taking of captives. So that was that regiment, the privateering regiment was sort of an extreme case, but- Like an all-star band of, of pirates. Um, and so part, again, part of- can, By the way, I, I've long said that someone should make a movie about those guys because it, it's, a, it's an amazing story. They come over to fight for, a, 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 you know, for the Dutch. By the time the Dutch, come, he, they get there in 1674, the war with the English is over. They go like, well, who else can we fight? Oh, let's go up to Maine and we're going to attack a French fort. And they take uh, Baron St. Castine's fort up in Maine and destroy that. And then they start picking off English uh, fishing boats, including, by the way, our friend John Freak, Elizabeth's uh, husband. So anyhow, it's, I mean, there's, again, like the whole arc of that story is, 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 is really fascinating. I'll leave it at that. From one bad, from one bad move to another, but they're the ones. I'm pretty sure they're the ones that bring in the Indians who get sent to Tangier. So I mentioned in my presentation that the the New England Native Americans went up in in um, uh, North Africa. They were picked up by uh, Mosley, Samuel Mosley, and his group. So well, and I guess as we're going to transition to to Anwan's talk for a second, I think that's the the perfect segue, uh, Margaret. Is that you know in many ways this is a local story. This is a story about the land in which we are currently residing, you know, wherever we are, this is the land we're talking about, the peoples who lived here. It's a story that goes back um, thousands of years. It's a story that comes to the present um, in court cases and that spans the globe, right? You know, in our, in our, you know, our call to people to talk about New England Native Americans, we're talking about Spain, we're talking about Jamaica, we're talking about, you know, Maine, we're talking about the Carolinas, we're talking about the creation of racial categories and the creation of, of legal systems where it's all this is tied together. And it's on, um, I think the charges for us as educators to, is to, to make sure our students um, can help see these connections. Um, not only with these topics, whether it's the Salem witch trials, again, you know, um, we could uh, just talk about Samuel Sewell, we could have Margaret and, and, and Tad talk for, for an hour about this guy. Um, but um, the witch trials and King Philip's war and 
you know, as Anawan tells us, talk about the Constitution and the, the Revolutionary War and, you know, everything else. Um, we don't have to talk about, we don't have to search for ways to talk about Native American history, whether we're talking about Andrew Jackson or, you know, the West or Alcatraz later on. Um, it's here. Um, and um, it's on us to, to, to keep trying to learn this history and to incorporate it and center it some. Hey, Brad, that, I guess the, yeah, go ahead. And I think too, the one thing that anyone, I really liked what he does is he talks about, you know, what the native peoples called themselves, what they called their lands, which is vastly different than the words that tend to survive from the English, or they're not understand, we don't understand their meaning, like, you know, like Massachusetts or like, like, you know, he talks in there about how the difference between Nipnuk and Wampanoag, and I'd even add another one to you, is that like Wampanoag and the Wabanaki in Maine are the same name. Mm -hmm. Basically means people of the, of the dawn or peace, people of first light. And the difference between Wampanoag and Wampanoag, it's kind of like the difference between maybe like a Brooklyn and a Boston accent, okay? Anyhow, so, so I think that, that that sensitivity that he talks about to the place is critical. Thanks for that. And, and Margaret, um, you know, the, the notion there, 15 Native American war captives in jail in Boston with some of the Salem accused witches. Um, the fact I didn't know that just shows I didn't read Tad's book closely enough. <laughs> um, but also it's just, that's just, you know, there are, there are many times throughout our history where we're talking about in our classes, where we're talking about stuff that the curriculum framework say we're supposed to talk about. But as Beth began, there are also things we're supposed to be doing, whether it's inclusion, whether it's, um, it's diversity perspectives, whether it's teaching historical empathy, and there are curriculum reasons, and there are more these larger kind of skill-based reasons to be talking about Native American history. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad to be a small part of this, this operation that's trying to help us do that. One way we're doing that is by exposing us to, um, to folks who can, who can give us the, the native, some, some of the Native perspective. And um, Anawan is, is one of those people. So we, we, again, we, we only got this from him last night and recognize that most people probably didn't have a chance to watch it between now, then and now. I want to sh give you, leave you with kind of five minutes and let him have kind of the last word of kind of, he begins, it's a, it's a really good talk that goes on. It's about an hour long, but the first five minutes are a nice kind of, hey, these are, if you do nothing else, do these things right. And I think that's a nice reminder for us as educators. So um, who's, is that All you right. sharing or you sharing? Yeah. yeah, I'll give it a try. All right, don't screw it up. Thanks. <laughs> She's been sending texts saying, I hope I can get this right. I'm, I'm sure you can. <laughs> okay. Bear with me one moment. Look at this. All right. We're just watching about five minutes of this, I think. Let me just. Way when he kisa square cross and it on part, that's we send one weed in North Mass, Mississippi Wampanoag. Hello, everybody. Uh, good day. Uh, my name is Anwan Weeden. I've been uh, asked to share some uh, cultural content, things that can be used uh, common throughout the Commonwealth to teach about the various various indigenous groups and populations of the region. Um, I've been working in education myself uh, pretty much my entire adult life. Uh, I've worked with reputable institutions such as uh, Boston Children's Museum and Plymouth Plantation with professional development. So uh, today, um, due to the short nature of time, I'm going to be jumping right into a PowerPoint, which will hopefully give you uh, some helpful tips on hidden histories, um, things that I personally have seen that aren't often brought up or maybe not enough emphasis is put on uh, focusing on those aspects of our culture. Um, but they're also beneficial just overall in general when learning about indigenous peoples. So uh, again, this will be fairly specific to the region. Um, I myself do represent three New England tribes. I have traveled to other tribes beyond the region. And if I can try to help uh, folks understand the broad and diversity of indigenous groups uh, during today's uh, uh, session, I will definitely do my best to make it as broad as possible. However, we're pretty much focusing on the Commonwealth. Um, so uh, getting started, uh, this image that you may see is a typical dwelling that you would see throughout the region, in all honesty, uh, typically used during the summer months or planting cycle. Um, so again, this is my contact information, and uh, I'll be sharing more of that later on in today's session. So one of the first slides here is core cultural content. Um, for me, this is like the bare bones basics that any teacher should consider when approaching teaching about indigenous people. 
Um, you'll notice it starts with, of course, local indigenous history begins long before 1492 even, um, definitely way before 1620. Um, we have well over 12,000 years of archeological evidence. So um, we know that we've been around here at least that long. I hope we have changed identities. The names of our groups have changed over the years, over the centuries, over the millennia, um, and as does the landscape as well. Um, we do still live here, as you can see. Um, that's a, a focus I don't see enough. Uh, we're, we're typically only spoken of in a past tense, and that's extremely damaging to Native communities. Um, it's, it's damaging to the, even those who learn about us because they're not given the opportunity to understand how we've evolved and that we don't live in teepees, we don't walk around in moccasins, and that's just the same as asking uh, any American, do you still wear buckles on your shoes or sail a boat around the world? I mean, it's, it's, it's just evolution, and for some reason we're kind of left out of that. So uh, the fact that we still live here and including contemporary information uh, is very helpful. Um, the indigenous identity is synonymous with their environment. So something that I realize help, helps me understand when I'm learning about other tribes is, you know, like, where's their land? What is it? Weather patterns, diet, all of it is what makes them who they are, their beliefs, you name it. Um, so I just wanted to point out that indigenous identity is synonymous with their environment. And these are great, uh, helpful tools uh, for, for children. Uh, if they were to look up a map and locate the Nipmuc, uh, I do have a map coming up in the next slide. You'll see what I'm talking about. Um, Nipmuc are the freshwater people. Um, the Wampanoag, people of the first light. Um, and it's literally due to their land that makes them who they are. And again, I'm going to do a map activity um, right after this that will help you understand how there really is no separate separation from the two. Um, so that's going to be helpful for you. Um, focusing on the land as well as the people. Um, so please no dress up for costumes. That's kind of a no brainer. However, uh, uh, I'm sad to say we're living in that time where I still see Pocahontas costumes at the Halloween outfit store. And uh, I actually have seen people, even celebrities, host uh, cowboy and Indian themed parties and uh, people like Kevin Hart and uh, can't remember the Australian actor plays Thor there. Um, I think they both come under criticism for that. So I do have to point it out and especially the teachers, because uh, one thing that I noticed uh, having worked in schools is a lot of the teachers often say, well, well, this is what we've always done. And it's obviously hard to break these cycles. So I just applaud those of you who are already stepping outside of the comfort zone or, you know, taking things into your own hands, changing the curriculum that may have just been handed to you from generations ago. Um, but as far as please no dress up or costumes, I mean, it's it's not something I see them doing with any other race. And I'm not quite sure why they do it with ours, even uh, beyond the typical classroom education. I mean, if you have children such as I do and you care about their lives that they live uh, they go to camps and some of these camps do weird sometimes horrific things with the kids uh, a lot of the names and things like that uh, imagery mascots obviously in your communities um, so there's obviously a lot that goes along with that um, so i just basically wanted to point it out make sure people are aware so i hope you can see just how useful um if you haven't had a chance to watch it yet just how useful it's going to be he spends the next three or four minutes talking about place names and the different um talking about how, how he used that map and how to read the map and how it, it tells us that history. And then it's just, it's just, it's a really, really good talk. And I, I learned a lot from it and a lot of stuff I can take directly to my classroom. What we want to do now, I think is what's is first of all, thank our panelists. Um, thank you, Tad. Thank you to Margaret for, um, for taking the time to record those presentations and for spending time with us. Um, I always learn from y'all and I really appreciate your um, your willingness to, to share your, your knowledge with us with us this morning. So thank you for that. Um, uh, any final words or last words? Oh, um, no, I just think it's, uh, I think the K through 12 is, is crucial. I think that, uh, you know, you're reaching an audience. I, I first learned about the Tulsa Race Massacre from my son who learned about it in Columbus City Schools three, three years ago. I had never heard about it. So I think you're, you're, you know, you, you know, teaching, you know, your teaching has huge ripple effects. So I think, uh, and, I, and I'm always very impressed at, at, you know, the sort of sophisticated things that teachers do uh, and the, you know, and the way people are incorporating a lot of primary, you know, things that we consider best practices for college teaching even that you're already doing. So I, I you know, I love, I love all the stuff you're doing. The one other thing I was saying is there's so, you know, in Massachusetts, you guys are so lucky. There are so many, 
you know, archives and town libraries that have documents or materials or town halls that has materials from the 17th and 18th and 19th century. So, I mean, it's a, it's a candy store of research uh, abilities. And I guess I would really support the, the, you know, the, you know, giving, giving these students the opportunity to, to engage with some of these materials, you know, structuring assignments that, that will let them be successful in doing so, but, you know, have them go out and, and learn these research skills too, I think is, is while learning the subject is a, a wonderful, a wonderful thing. Yeah, handling the old stuff and going, you know, going into the archives when we can do that again is such a wonderful thing. Um, Margaret, I don't know if you've told Hassan that that's when you learned about um, the Tulsa um, race riot, but if our uh, massacre, but um, I'm sure he'd have some thoughts about that. Uh, um, Tad, last words? Sure. No, um, thank you, Brad. As always, it's, it's a pleasure and great working with you. Um, we have wicked smart people in our department like Brad, and I'm just thrilled to be, be part of that team. Um, the one thing I say is that I, I, I try to stress this in my talk is that in some degrees, Margaret's right, there's lots of stuff out there. We are we have an embarrassment of riches in Essex County, but also how much stuff is missing still, right? So don't assume it's a complete record. Um, and again, too, you know, realize, think about why things survive and why things don't. Um, and particularly, too, I would talk, there was this question there about, well, how about native language in Essex County? Well, you know, unfortunately, Pawtucket doesn't really survive as a language. Uh, and it's the people here were so shattered and destroyed and displaced in the 17th century um, that I don't think there are any efforts underway now to recover that language. Uh, but having said that, the nearby language is very close to it. Uh, so it's worth looking at like what the Wampanoag are doing because it's very similar. And, and the, but also to think, the, I think maybe the, my last point is that, but even though I talk about these people being displaced and, 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 and really brutalized, that doesn't mean that their descendants didn't survive, that they're not there now, as Anawan points out. And that's true for the Pawtucket as well too. There are pockets. You're gonna find most of them in places like New Hampshire, or they, they, they became part of praying towns that are, are actually Massachusetts or Wampanoag or Nipmuc today. Um, so I think it's important to sort of stress to me like that, that, that continuing that it's a, we only have a partial story that survives, but in, but in part, the people did survive. And that to me is, is, the, is the critical point. Great. Thank you again, Tad and Margaret. I really, really, really appreciate it. And great, great to see you both. Um, what we're gonna do now as, as a group is, is transition over to Brian, who is, um, who's also Margaret and Brian are just collecting awards from the OEH. Brian, as you may know, is the, I think the reigning OEH National Teacher of the Year, um, which means that there's a lot of pressure for him not to screw up this next presentation. Um, he's going to share us with some of his um, some of his thoughts about um, how to to use kind of local history sources and to um, to 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 bring these larger kind of big picture historical um, themes of questioning narratives and looking at whose stories get told um, by looking at the Hannah Dustin story and um, and how we view the history. So Brian, it's all yours. Thanks. Thanks for the pressure too. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to go through this quick because I want to give you guys some time for the breakout rooms. But um, my big thing is is looking and kind of reassessing history and and kind of re like like reexamining how we view history. And this is I was hoping to do this with some students, but a lot of the students I've I've done uh, some of the things with the past couple of uh, sessions. You know, they they just decided to graduate. You know, and it's really tough to get them graduation week to uh, give up a couple hours to hang out with me uh, and do this stuff. But um, I'm going to go around some of the the, the imagery uh, with Hannah Dustin. And these two images here are, are two monuments that were erected. And I don't want to give a too much away right now, but the one on the left is in Haverhill. And it was it was put up in uh, 17 or 1879. And the one on the right is up in New Hampshire. And that was 1874. I want you to keep in mind those dates because I think that they're important in understanding why they were put up and how you can have discussions with your students about it, okay? And um, as we go through. I'm going to try to do this really, really quick because, again, I want you guys uh, to have some time to go through the sources. But as we're looking at the stuff, um, I want you to use the thinking routine, see, think, wonder. OK, what do you see? What does it make you think? And what do you wonder about it? OK, and these are ways that you can kind of engage with your students to kind of examine and then really kind of think deeper about what they're viewing. 
I'll let you guys uh, put this in the like in the chat. There are three different images here. They're they're all from um, John Frost. Um, it's a 1870s um, book that was made, and these are some woodcuts that appear in the book. What do you see? What does it make you think? And what do you wonder about all of these? You could throw that in the chat. depicting Native Americans in a negative way as savages. Violent imagery. Why? Why do you think that they're doing that? And, that, and, and that's the kind of, of thing, again, I'm going through this quick and I'm not giving you guys a lot of wait time because I want to get to something else, but why? To create fear. And, 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 and that's a really good, um, that's, that's, that's perfect. You know, and, and what does this kind of create for the viewer? kind of the critical media literacy piece to it. What's the goal behind creating these? Why do you have this, this person on the right kind of lurking? Um, why do you have um, the, the people on the left tearing the clothes off of that person? What, what, like, what is the author's goal in creating this, okay? Um, violent, to make people fearful, to, 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 to like do all of that. Half naked people with feathers. Um, definitely. I think all of these are very, very deliberate in their attempts to, to kind of create a narrative. And one of the things that, that Anawan and, and, and we've talked about in this, um, like in these sessions is, are breaking down those misconceptions. And I, and I think that you can really examine these with your students and break down, well, what's the goal behind that? Why are they doing this? Um, how does it make you feel? How many things are accurate? How many things are not accurate? Okay, I'm going to go to the next one and kind of going on to the to the Hannah Dustin um, pictures on the bottom of this. I want to stop on this one and the picture on the left is is a woodcut and the picture on the right is is on the base of the um, monument in Haverhill. What do we see here? She's standing over the kidnappers while they're sleeping. Um, white people as victors. I like that. I like that. So she's about to um, kill 10 people. Okay. Um, that's what she's going to do. Um, and you definitely do get the um, idea of, of being this being a heroic thing. Okay. Ah, the teepees. That's what I was hoping you guys would get. Why? Why are they using teepees? Were, were, like, were teepees um, something that they would have had in like, like in New England? Is this perpetuating those stereotypes? And, 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 and I think Tad was talking about that. People show up with their buckskins in their, in, in their headdresses and, and that's what Native Americans are supposed to be. So this is kind of reinforcing some of those, those um, misconceptions and stereotypes about what a indigenous person is supposed to be where they're supposed to live, how they're supposed to act. And, and I think that that is a, an interesting piece that you could use with your students in breaking it down. And again, we could go, we could spend hours doing this, but um, I wanted to, to kind of talk about that, the, the, the inaccuracies of it. Yeah, why would they be sleeping outside if there, um, if there are shelters for them? That seems kind of silly. I'm going to go to the next one, which is a completely different view. It's the same thing. What's like, what's changed here? In color. <laughs> yes, it's in color. What else? 
I'll go back for a sec. How has the narrative changed? It is action, more violent. Okay, you do have a Native American defending. You might have to know a little bit more of the story. Is this supposed to be a young boy? The boy is missing, good. Okay, those are like, those can all be used as ways to show what's the narrative? What, like, what are they trying to do with these images? How are they kind of reshaping history? How, like, why are they doing that? What's the goal behind it? What's, um, what is the author trying to prove or, or disprove? Okay, um, pleading, I like that. So that leads us to how we should examine history and um, looking at some critical media literacy here and the misconceptions behind a lot of the things. And this is an educational card um, from the night, I, I think it was, it was made in like 1979, um, so 70s or 80s. This is what Thanksgiving was. And you could break that down a ton. Like, is it, would it have been on these big long tables? Would they, would they have had all of this, this stuff? Would they have been dressed like that? Like, there are so many things you can break down with your students on kind of um, debunking a lot of the myths in, in that. Go to the next one. Um, something I, I, I noticed here, what do you guys think about this image here on the left? Why do you think it's, it's like that? What do you see? What does it make you wonder? Think about the positioning of people. Power, definitely. Power, schooling. You have the, the white colonist kind of looking down on the indigenous person here. Okay, and kind of it, they give that sense of authority, looking down, kind of delivering a message to that person, and I, and, and that's and, and you could break that down and spend a lot of time with your students examining that type of, of power struggle. Okay, maybe he's in trouble. Okay, go to the next one. So. If you guys are interested in how history can change, because I, I, I think that that's one of the big goals of this whole session and in sessions that we've had before, is re-examining how we teach history. And this is a re really interesting book, History in the Making, and it examines how history books have changed throughout history. And if you, if you were to look at a history book from, I don't know, the 1840s, there, uh, there was a really interesting chapter about the Vikings and how important the Vikings were in 1840. And they had like a whole page dedicated to the Vikings. And as history has, has gone, that, that page has turned into a paragraph or two to now it's a couple of sentences. So we are constantly re-examining history. And I think when, when, when you're in your classrooms, it's, it's, very vi it's like really vital to examine what are you reading in textbooks? How are like, what is the narrative? What is the goal behind it? I think we constantly have to be critical in how we look at history. We have to look at it from a variety of different lenses. And those are all the thinking skills that I think we want to impart our, uh, upon our students. You know, I think it's, it's, it's easy just to tell them a bunch of stuff, but when you can do go through some of these activities and examine what do you see? Why do you see it? And allow them to process it and allow them to process it from a variety of different lenses. History becomes something that is not just a memorization of facts and that, and it becomes a, a, a more critical thinking skill. And it's something that they can take with them when they're watching different news stations or getting different messages from variety of, of, of different places, okay? So now on to the monuments. And there's, there's been a lot of controversy around the Hannah Dustin monuments and whether or not that they should stay um, and how they can be used. Um, and, and, what, and what are we celebrating? And again, you have to start asking your students, 
when were they put up? And for, for a number of years, these were, were, were very progressive um, monuments. This, this was the first woman um, ever put onto a monument. And it created this, this narrative of a, um, a heroic female figure. Okay, a one of the 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 colonial mothers. Okay, um, and it, it kind of guiding the country um, through a lot of different things, and it, it it was a very powerful symbol. Okay, but she also killed ten people to gain her freedom and scalped them and brought the scalps back, and that has to be recognized. Okay, and again, I'm going through this quickly, but it reminded me of um, some of the, the issues that we've had and some of the debates that we've had about Confederate monuments moving forward and how, what should we do with them? Why were they put up? What was the, the, like, the, like the goal behind them? And a lot of the Confederate monuments that were, that were put up in the late 19th, early 20th centuries were to reinforce the idea of Jim Crow. Were these monuments put up in the 1870s to kind of celebrate the 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 uh, wars on the like on the Great Plains and the eradication of um, Indigenous people? I don't I don't know. But you could have that discussion with your students. What was the goal behind them? Um, I want to kind of wrap up quickly, but. Um, Ken Levin is the one who wrote this, and he's actually. Um, He's, he's out in, I think, Waltham. He's a teacher in uh, Waltham, but he's done a lot on the Civil War and monuments and that. And I think that when you look at these monuments, you can re-examine them. And I think it can bring clarity to often misunderstood and ignored parts of history and kind of understanding memory. And I think that these monuments could be a teaching tool and you can have these kind of discussions with your students about um, why they're there. I think you can examine them in different ways. And I think that, that I think um, Helen asked the question earlier about cancel culture and, and re-examining culture. And I think that that's a, a key thing in, in, in what, like what we could do in our classrooms is you can examine things in different ways. Um, and I went through that pretty quickly. Uh, I'll turn it back over if we have any questions. There's a lot in the chat that I was, couldn't read, but. Thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, I really think that this, this presentation is helping us move from some of this content. I mean, there's so much to consider here. We have to sort of absorb content. We have to understand then, well, how am I gonna, how am I gonna um, help students understand what I'm, I'm learning as well? And I think Brian has given us a really wonderful example, a local example. Um, somebody in the chat also wrote that, um, that she really appreciated being told about this story as a young girl because it helped her to have an interest in local history. And she saw this as, oh my gosh, a woman that, that you know, is being celebrated. So we, we also have to acknowledge that there's just a lot of layers to this and that it is very complex and that there was true danger for colonists who were living. Um, you know, we can't discount that this was a very, very violent time. And I think what we're trying to say is that let's add on to those layers and then as Brian is saying, let's really understand why we're more, why we are memorializing the things that we're memorializing and in the time period in which we're memorializing them is another really great window into this idea of historiography that I think even younger students need to start to think about that, you know, historians have written histories for different reasons and different justifications. And that's a big theme of what we're talking about today. Thank you so much, Brian. I think we can move. Yeah, I'll jump in real quickly, just, just on that point is that, you know, we're talking about private um, violence and, you know, individual actions, but that's where Margaret's kind of presentation and sources about like the state paying for scalps, um, you know, Massachusetts, you know, endorsing this, this activity um, and compensating people for it reminds us it's not just private action, it, that, you know, private actions become state actions, become law. Um, and incentivize people. And I think that's important to move some, to toggle back and forth between individuals and, and the, the institutions we have as well. 
Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming back. Um, we hope that you had some very productive and good discussions in those breakout groups. Um, and, and maybe you were even um, able to take a look at some of the sources that we've provided. Um, we do have the website that we've created. Um, hopefully you've got that link and you can see that, you know, we've, we've tried to provide some, some resources for you. Um, did just want to point out that um, we, we have in one section of the website, there are some recommended resources by each of the pre, uh, presenters, including Anawan. Um, if you haven't watched his presentation yet, <clears throat> he gives like a really good bibliography of some stuff that he suggests. And then um, he had that map that he thought would be um, useful for, for teachers. We've included that. I think Sherry put it as a PDF. We also have his slideshow there. Um, and so I, I, none of that was included in the breakout groups that you just were in. So I just wanted to mention that those resources are available. Um, and I think Brad's going to just walk us through a, a little debrief. Um, we'd love to hear um, from a couple of you about, about your discussions. Yeah, and, and that, thanks, Beth. And I think that's just the general question is that, you know, as I, we began all this by saying, this is a lot, right? This is a lot of information, it's a lot of topics, a lot of, a lot of sources. Um, and this, we just want, it's like a, like a sampling of it, but we're interested um, in hearing what you talked about in your groups, either if you're reflecting on some of the sources that um, you're, you, um, that were presented to your group, or if just you're reflecting on the other conversations and the presentations we had. We can't have time to hear from everyone, unfortunately. Um, but if someone wants to share a couple of things they talked about in their groups, and you can, um, we will obviously you'd raise your hand and talk about it. And you can also put some, some topics in the chat, just so we get a sense, a, a feedback loop here of, of what's, what's resonated. So who wants to go? Mm. I'll call on people. <laughs> All right, I'll go, Brad. You twisted my arm. Thank you, Lori. You're welcome. Um, our group, we talked about a lot. Um, I, we were in group nine, so we were looking at the, um, had a, the Hannah Dustin uh, materials. And um, there was a lot of things that came up. The you know, some one member of our group talked about how they love the, the think, see, wonder thing. That would be a great way to, you know, to implement the documents. Um, we talked about connecting current events to like as a activator, do now, whatever we want to call it, because I think in different districts, we call it something else um, or something different. And the vice principal just came to your building. Is that what... Say that again. Depending on which vice principal just came to your building and, and changed everything up pretty well you mean principal yeah yeah don't even get me started um so <laughs> um and then oh and then i i brought into the the conversation about um i have a co-taught ell um two co-taught ell classes sophomores and um the images i think they would do okay with but my concern would be around some of the reading and the documents and it might be a little hard for them so we would have to create you know some scaffolding and some supports for them to, you know, to be able and some translations, whatever, to enable them to, you know, dive right in and be able to access the documents. Great. Thank you, Lori. And I, I know that um, a lot of us teach in districts that have um, a large population of students for whom English is not a first language. And I think the visual sources um, and people are talking in the chat about ways to kind of to really kind of touch in a kind of social, emotional um, learning goals. Um, using visual sources can be a way to to do a lot of the critical thinking skills without having us read kind of archaic 18th or 17th century language. Um, thanks, Lord. Someone else from a, someone who's group nine is off the hook in at least two ways. Um, who wants to go? Just something from the chat. There's definitely a bunch of images um, on the website and I do have some other ones that um, I was going to put on. So. Uh, I'm a big image guy, and I think that there's a lot to unpack with the imagery looking at this topic. So um, I definitely think there's there's more out there, too. Great. Did you find yourselves, um, I'll ask this maybe, um, did you find yourselves kind of talking more about what we had kind of collectively experienced in the conversation with Margaret and Tad and the resources, or um, or about the resources that were new to you in the, in the chat and the, the breakout groups? Wrap it up, people. I've missed online teaching. <laughs> so 
our group definitely ended up talking a lot more about the conversation in the panelist discussion and what we were hearing. And it's similar things. I done the other um, teaching hidden histories one. And we also talked about the importance of the idea that we don't want it to just turn into like snapshots right. going, these people exist, they exist throughout the history, especially two of us are US history teachers and going a lot of times it's similar to the African-American experience where you'll talk about like the enslavement and then you'll talk about civil war and then you'll talk about civil rights movement but these people exist beyond that and trying to show that it's not just the experience with the colonists they have all this other like they existed they lived here they had all these other experiences and trying to make sure that students understand that while well, we might talk about the colonists for a little bit, there's an, all these other groups existing during this time and we got to talk about their histories and their experiences that it's just not violence towards these people or wars that and conflicts that they're involved in. They live their daily lives, they interact with each other, they interact with the colonists, they interact with everybody. And we got to make sure to bring that into the conversation too, so that the students aren't just getting like, oh, here they are during like the colonization period, here they are with Western expansion, here they are, that there's so many other pieces that we got to bring in as we continue to move forward in this process. Right. Thank you so much for that, Lisa. And I know it's, um, you know, the, the, the bringing the voices that the, um, when we talk about the African American history, one of the things that we often think about is that it's not just a story, it's not a story of only oppression, it's a story of resistance. Every day there's resistance, every day there was agency, every day there was there was you know joy and there was there's love and there was commitments and there were, there were other things as well. The other thing I'd just point out, so just a, a book I had sitting here, but I, I should have planned to have it sitting here. It's a really nice, you'll see it's a short synthesis um, by Jared Hardesty, um, who's a historian, I think he lives out west now. Um, it's called Black Lives, Native Lands, White Worlds. It's a history of slavery in New England. And it's as, you know, again, text, 150 pages. If you want a resource to kind of get you up to speed, um, there are chapters in there that you could assign to students, but it is about the whole, about slavery and colonization. Um, it includes some of the stories Margaret told about. It includes um, stories we've learned in other contexts and it grounds it in New England. There are a lot of Salem and Essex County examples. This is, um, this is a, a book worth um, picking up and, and thinking about. Oh, look at that, Beth has it. We didn't even plan that. I should have given you that A. Um, uh, it's, you're talking about what's important, Lisa. It's also important uh, um, to end these things on time. It's a beautiful day. We've got a, a full schedule um, in front of us, including a dance recital for some of us. Um, Beth, did you want to say some final words and kind of wrap it up? Or how do you want to do it? Yes. I hope that the um, link that I just put in the chat right there, I hope that goes to the agenda. At the end of the agenda, there are some forms that we'd be very grateful if you could just take a couple of minutes to fill out. One is just saying that you attended today's session and that helps us with our grant so that we just keep track of that. Another is uh, a little evaluation. We always welcome feedback. And we also have a summer opportunity, PD opportunity. Um, it's all about like using our, um, <clears throat> our uh, local resources to integrate those into curriculum. And today's actually the last day to um, sign up for that. That's going to be the first week of August. We'd love to have you join us if you'd like to. Um, so all of those are in the very bottom part of your agenda, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and I will send this out in an email and uh, to everyone as well, just in case that that link um, went by too quickly. Um, but we also are offering PDPs and stipends. Uh, if you're a teacher and you'd like to earn those, that's on the website. Um, and uh, we thank you so much for joining us. We're in talks right now thinking about ways that we can, um, you know, maybe continue some of this work. Um, perhaps next year, we're gonna have to look for some more funding. So fingers crossed, we, we hope to continue with it. Um, and for those of you who um, have given us um, uh, your time in these sessions, but then also some of you have done the PDP work and given us lesson plans. They've been wonderful. And so we, we do want to try to share these resources more broadly. I know that Bruce had asked, will these resources be available to other people that maybe just couldn't join us for the sessions? Again, we're going to try to figure out ways to make that happen. Um, anything else, Brian or Sherry? I just can't thank everyone enough for, for being part of this. And um, a successful heritage for kind of taking this uh, idea that that my students had and that I 
kind of advocated for them to do and, and for all of you to be part of it. Brad did an okay, like an okay job of uh, moderating. <laughs> 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 Got to give it back to Brad. He gives it to everyone else. Um, but yeah, just thank you. And, and there's definitely so much more. And um, there's there's a lot of other avenues that, that we could go down and, and hopefully we'll be able to. But thank you again. Yeah, the one thing I'll end is that Margaret said to be sure that everyone knew that um, her email is like newell.20 at osu.edu. You can find it on the website. If you have questions specifically about enslavement in New England, um, she's one of the best people in the world to ask um, contact. She, she said she has a, um, you know, a, a, I think a, a cousin who teaches in Andover. She's really connected to the area and, and she's just a good person. I can say that now she's gone. Um, she was, <laughs> she's a great advisor. She's a good friend and um, she'd be a fantastic resource if any of y'all want to reach out to her. All of the presenters have been so generous and I know Anawan in particular would love to hear from you. He sent his contact information um, particularly. So once again, thank you everyone and hope to see you again sometime soon. Bye-bye. Yeah.